Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's MHPN webinar, Self-Care, How to Be a Sustainable Practitioner. Tonight, we have a great panel joining us um, to have this really important discussion, which I think we will all agree is, is really relevant and pertinent for all of us at the moment. So I'm your facilitator for this evening. Uh, my name is Nicola Palfrey. I'm a clinical psychologist based in Canberra, and I'm excited to share with you um, our wonderful panel, uh, Dr. Roger Sexton and Hugh Kearns. But before we begin, um, I wanted to welcome all of you that are joining us. We've got 850 and climbing participants, which is wonderful given how much everybody has on at the moment. Um, but first of all, I want to importantly to acknowledge the traditional custodians in the lands uh, of the lands on which we're all joining tonight. Um, I would like to pay my respects to the the elders of the Ngunnawal land from which I'm joining in Canberra to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and welcome you all from the lands that you are joining us on tonight across Australia. Um, so first of all, I want to introduce, introduce our panel to you so we can get into this. We've had the bios distributed, so we're not going to go through the long bios because they are um, take up precious time from the good content we've got tonight and also they're hard to listen to sometimes when you're the, the panellist. So I'm going to go straight into it and introduce you to Dr. Roger Sexton. Roger is a general practitioner but has many other strings to his bow and a lot of work in this important area. And Roger has provided us with a workbook that you all hopefully have had a chance to have a look at or if not you at least have access to. So welcome Roger, nice to see you here tonight. I was wondering if you could kick us off tonight by telling us a little bit about the resource and how you think it may be useful for people joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks Nicola and welcome everybody. Great to have you here tonight and great to be here as well. Thank you for giving up your night for tonight. Um, it's really about you tonight and the purpose of tonight is really to uh, reflect on ourselves and, and in fact we want you to be the case study for tonight. Your own silk will be the case study. Um, we hope you've had the opportunity to download the workbook and, and complete parts or as much of it as you'd, as you'd like. So if you haven't downloaded it, maybe if you can do that now, if you have a printer, it'd be good to use it with the, with the webinar. But otherwise, you can do so later on. Uh, and when you work through the reflective questions and exercises in the workbook in your own time. So this, the workbook is really yours to consider and reflect upon and ask you a series of questions which really uh, ask you to, um, I think, try and put together those aspects of your life and to see how, how sustainable you may be. I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but it's really a, a concept, I think, uh, and a very simple visual that allows you to uh, identify uh, deficiencies and areas where perhaps you may be a little bit unsustainable. So I think the, the workbook is there for you to use in your own way. It's a bit diagrammatic and there's questions and exercises through it, um, but hopefully you find it useful and as a reflective tool during and after the uh, webinar. Fantastic. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, I think it's interesting. We need to kind of use these tools that we often get our uh, clients, patients, other um, people that we work with to do. So we need to do it for ourselves. So thank you. I look forward to you unpacking it a little bit with us tonight. And I also want to welcome Hugh um, Kearns, who's an educator and researcher joining us this evening. Welcome, Hugh. Hello. Hi, nice to see you. Um, just a quick opening from you, Hugh. It, there's lots of different areas from our conversations that you've worked in. I was wondering what has drawn you into into this space around and self-care and sustainability for practitioners. Yeah. yeah, well, first of all, hello to everybody who's here. And uh, just uh, Roger and I are both here in Adelaide and just to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Garna Aboriginal people here in Adelaide. And uh, yeah, it's interesting why we do it. I suppose I've always been really intrigued with the idea of why don't people do what they say they would like to do? You know, that people know what they should do, but then don't do it. And that's an intriguing thing. And I was always interested in why that's the case. And self-care is really good at that. Most people know what they should do, but don't end up doing it. So I was intrigued by that. And in particular, the psychology of what makes that difficult and hard. And so that's why I suppose I like working in that area because it's a very obvious one. People are very aware of it, but still don't do it. And so we'll and talk a little bit about that later on. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. It's a lesson for all of us. Why don't we follow our own advice? Mm -hmm. So the learning objectives, I've got them for you there. Um, 
we don't need to kind of read them out for you. It's really about how we manage our work and our workload, our professional and our personal lives. And uh, as Roger has outlined, he's got a, a great framework for us to um, look at and use maybe to frame um, putting some conscious effort into this tonight. So I'm going to suggest without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Roger, and you can direct me as we move through your slides, give me a nod or next one, please. And uh, over to you. Thank you, Roger. Do That's great. So thanks, Nick. So this, this, and I, I'm a visual person. I like colours, pictures, and I think a picture tells a thousand words. And um, uh, this is a case where I think we're all aware of aspects of our lives that are, uh, tr we're trying to integrate a lot of things together to remain effective and, and, um, and very productive. And um, it's nice to have a model to put this together. So really what the, this webinar is trying to do is introduce you to perhaps a new way of thinking about your sustainability as a mental health practitioner over time. So by sustainability, what I mean by that is personal and professional productivity and longevity. So and more colloquially, this is basically sticking around for a long time and doing great stuff. And the model brings aspects of your life together in a sort of simple visual, and it's just a way of highlighting also the missing bits, the bits where you think they are deficient, and that is maybe one reason why I'm struggling in in, um, in a way. So your feedback on this would be very useful uh, as as the uh, as we as we go through. So just the next slide, thanks, Nicole. So there are four pillars, if you like. These Pillars are interdependent, the ingredients that contribute to growth and productivity over time. We're finding that um, this underpins sustainability. They're interrelated and they're interdependent. And unsustainable individuals tend to often uh, focus uh, overly on one or more of these or not focus at all on some or all of them. And uh, Remember, as we go through this, your workbook, think about your own situation. Think of yourself as the case study tonight and, and what I'll be talking about in, in terms of this. But when we look at this diagram, we start with the inputs. We start with what we need to get going. And this, of course, are our inputs, resources that we carry with us from preconception right through to each phase of our personal and professional lives. So you think of your uh, genetics, think of parenting, think of your nutrition over your lifetime, think of uh, your personality traits, for example, your education as an input, your postgrad training, your life experiences as an input, which you bring into your life and work, wisdom. These are the sort of things that go in. There's many, many inputs, but they're just examples of those. Then we then how are we going to organise ourselves to put these resources to best use? So for that, we need an operating manual, our own personal operating manual, how we do things, our modus operandi, if you like, our, our habits, uh, the choices we make about how we manage things. And in this respect, think about your own health, uh, how you manage your costs, how you manage your stress, how you manage your time, something you'll be speaking about a lot later. What are your lifestyle habits like? How do you run your family life at home? How do you manage your money? These are the, all the things that you normally have in your operating manual that should um, optimise the, the, the resources that you bring forward in life. And then uh, what our rule book, our operating manual, will help us to do and create. This, of course, is our outputs, what we do, what we create, what we do, what we produce, and how we behave. Our behaviour is an output, very important output. <laughs> and this, of course, is personal both personal and professional. And then finally, how, how do we know we're succeeding in doing things that are appreciated, that are needed, um, that are relevant, that have impact? And this, of course, is feedback, uh, if you like, a form of performance appraisal. And of course, external uh, feedback is very valuable. Internal feedback, that little voice inside our head that sometimes overrides everything, is, is where there's often a lack of balance in unsustainable people. And of course, feedback then becomes a critical input and perpetuates the cycle. This is the self-sustaining cycle which allows us to remain sustainable, We're doing great stuff over a long period of time. Next slide. 
So critically important for, for us is what motivates this. There are lots of these. You'll recognise some of these, no doubt, in the list. Things that motivated you to, uh, to enter your career as it currently stands. But next slide. Over time, the motivators can change throughout a working life away from the sort of altruistic um, towards more financial, domestic security, and if you like, working on the business side of things. The next slide. Another important input is what we need, our needs. Needs are highly motivating, and there's a number of these. I'm sure you're familiar with all of them. There's the existence needs, uh, the basics of hydration, nutrition, the needs that are commonly neglected by unsustainable uh, medical health practitioners who may come to work or uh, um, particularly dehydrated, uh, underfed or overfed or suboptimally fed, uh, lacking sunlight and vitamin D, lacking adequate exercise to feel well and a bit sleep deprived. These are existence needs that are so, such important inputs into our, into, our, into our lives. Next slide. We also need, uh, we have existential needs. You're very familiar with these. There are many variations of these, but these are four that I find are very important in, uh, in professional life. Certainly uh, having someone to love and someone who loves you, uh, having hope, a sense of something to look forward to, uh, a, a meaning, a sense of purpose, a reason to get out of bed in the morning to principally to help others in, in that case, and control that is choice and autonomy. So they have very important needs that are often lacking in unsustainable people. Next slide. And McClellan, you'll recall, was a psychologist, American psychologist in the 60s, who postulated and his acquired needs theory. These are needs that emerge over our working lives and we acquire combinations of some or all of these. There's a need for achievement. People are drawn to, say, uh, business startups, projects, uh, enjoying really good clinical success, research outcomes, academic goals, that sort of thing. And next is our need for affiliation with people. Uh, this is reflected in a choice of clinical work, uh, working teams or committees and that sort of thing. And thirdly, power over others. This is for people who like being managers, bosses, writing policies, uh, the regulators, business owners, the CEO type of people who like power over others and power through others are those of us who mentor, who teach, who have a philanthropic view. So these are all needs that are acquired. They're very important inputs into, into uh, our, our toolkit of resources that we bring into our lives. The next slide. Another really important input is our personality traits. Again, they're very important. Uh, that you're, we, we, there's several dozen of these, but there's three that seem to crop up very often in my contact with uh, medical and health professionals. Um, and they have, they're a double-edged sword. They, with the, the obsessional health professional, uh, often you know very thorough, very, very caring, fear of making a mistake. But with that, hand in hand goes a propensity to anxiety, and um, becoming quickly overburdened, burnout particularly. The avoidant health, mental health practitioner often can't say no. Very quickly build up a very loyal and long following, and very hard to get rid of patients like that once they. Um, uh, once you may have completed treatment. So very easily can become overburdened and may go home at night and self-medicate with alcohol or benzodiazepines to sort of, um, you know, relieve them of the, uh, of the burden of the day. And dependent mental health practitioners, you know, um, often really enjoy hearing the stories of other people and sharing bits of their own lives and often develop quite close relationships with, um, with people. Sometimes the point where it can become overwhelming and a depression, a depressing, and also the propensity to the so-called boundary violations that you're all familiar with. So, these are things that we bring into our um, into our into our toolkit. Uh, next slide. Also, as we're a source of energy to uh, our patients. So, how we energise ourselves is a critical input, and you need to have ways of recharging yourself during the day. So it's, it's worth thinking about it, reflecting in your workbook, how do you remain energetic so you can give the last patient of the day exactly the same level of care as the first patient? So is your consulting room energising and uplifting? Or does it have depressing dated interior decor, dying plants and no fresh air or, and, and no access to water? So think about how you energise yourself in ways other than maybe drinking coffee. The so next slide. 
So let's look now at the next pillar. This is your operating manual. This is how we do things, your rule book for how you live your life. This includes your, your lifestyle choice. It's ne next slide. All of these things are important. It's incredible how um, you know, a number of health, mental health practitioners neglect these uh, and expect to, um, to keep going, often with huge uh, workloads. So coming to work sleep deprived, as I said, uh, vitamin D deficient, aerobically unfit, dehydrated, and malnourished is, is not uncommon in busy health professionals. Next slide. How do you manage your time? Hugh will speak to this, uh, an expert. Next slide. How do you manage your working week? How interesting is this? How some people work in a ridiculous way. Um, uh, you know, do you control how many patients you see, or are you under the control of your receptionist? <laughs> uh, is your working week interesting? Is it full of variety? Do you remain seated most of the week uh, in the same room seeing people? These are sort of ways that we can control how we work. This is the rule book of how we work in our lives. Next, manage, uh, next, next slide. In stress management, you know, how, you, how do you manage this yourself? I won't, this is obviously a huge subject and you know all about it, but I just ask that question. Do you recognise when you are under stress? Uh, how do you recognise that? What are symptoms do you experience and what do others notice when you're under stress? What, what, do you, what, do, what would they say about you that indicates you're under stress? So feedback about this is a critical pillar. Instead of someone saying, look, I think I'm just tired and a bit overworked, Others may observe you thinking you're clearly depressed and burnt out. And so this external feedback is so important. Next slide. And next slide again. So the other thing is how we manage our burden. What I mean by burden is what we choose to carry around with us. The bricks represent our uh, unsolved or unresolved problems and responsibilities. Generally, others have placed there or that we choose to place there ourselves and take on. So as such, the, the, the burden is not an output. This is, this, this is a process of how we choose to work. We choose to take on other people's problems. Now, how we deal with them is also another um, operating manual chapter, I suppose. But really, we often see uh, mental health practitioners who are carrying an enormous burden and examples of that burden are on the slide. They may be studying, have an academic burden. There may be a tremendous uh, flotilla of difficult patients who are very demanding and very worrying, suicidal and a whole range of things. We all know about patients like that. It only takes one of those to make life very difficult. We may be carrying the burden of a complaint, which we often take very personally. Uh, the burden of uh, failure, clinical failure particularly, um, the burden of fatigue. Uh, and how we manage that, how do you manage fatigue. There may also be debt related to business, uh, et cetera. The burden of success is an interesting one too, where some people are so involved in things and they cannot extricate themselves from chairmanships of this, committee membership of that, commitments. Often they may find it very, very difficult. So just think about your own burden, what you're carrying, and, and, and everyone's very keen to dump their bricks into your barrow because, um, you know, it relieves their bird, but it's whether you're prepared, how much you're prepared to take on is how you run your life, part of your operating manual. Next slide. Another most interesting area I see often is um, very poor financial management, how we manage our money. Again, in the rule, in our operating manual is how we manage our money. Do we get good advice? Do we spend everything and try and save later? Do we uh, make poor investment choices. Um, do we take business risks? These are critical things. Next slide. How we manage crises. Again, extraordinary how some um, health professionals uh, have a sense of immunity to illness, potentially mental illness too. We treat it, we don't get it. Um, not planning for emergencies at home or at work. Often practices not planning for acute workforce shortages and having to cover absent, absence uh, of others and, uh, and key person risk. A lack of income disability insurance. Uh, most interesting how some health professionals don't have that. Uh, they think they'll never get ill. And um, so next slide, if, you, if just imagine if this happened to you tomorrow, if you came to, uh, you know, an accident or fallen or also a vehicle accident, if you were unable to work for six months, would you be prepared for that? This should be in your 
operating manual, what you would do if you had a crisis like this. Next slide. Now we're looking at your outputs. Um, next slide again. These can be, of course, these are things we do uh, in our personal lives, in our professional lives, and particularly how we behave. And our personal um, roles are many. I've only listed a few there, but generally speaking, uh, work can sometimes squeeze these out. So you may find your role as a wife, as a mother, as a sister, as a, uh, as a daughter, uh, are, are being pushed aside by other things. And certainly life is richer when you're able to fulfil these other personal roles. These are an important output as an individual. You have these personal roles that you fulfil is a, is a very important output. Next slide. And then we have our professional outputs. Um, it's not uncommon for uh, many of us to have roles across all of these areas. We have our clinical work, of course. We have our research, uh, a research commitment for some of us. You may be teaching, you may be running a business and involved in the administrative side. You may have an academic commitment. You may work for your college. And it's not unusual for people to, um, to uh, basically say that, you know, they love research, they love teaching, but their um, life is occupied by administration. The whole day is full of paperwork and admin. So they're really, you know, their outputs are in the wrong area. Next slide. And of course, our behaviour is an output. Now, how do you behave when you're unwell? How does your behaviour contribute to the positive culture in the workplace? And do you behave differently when you get home? If so, why? Why is that? <laughs> do you let them have it when you get home? Or uh, are you really super nice at work and then you behave quite differently when you get home? These are things that are very important. Uh, next slide. Of course, with some people, you just don't know. This is a Harold Shipman. He's a GP in the UK who basically he killed 250 of his patients. A lovely guy, much loved and revered and appreciated. But he had this nasty habit of bumping off the old people in his practice. And so you just often can't tell with people how they're going. And uh, you know, we may put up a... Uh, a, a nice facade only to find that underneath we're dealing and struggling with things. Now the fourth pillar, next slide, this is the critical one, this is the pillar upon which many unsustainable people have the least focus. So the question here is where and from whom do you source feedback in your own case? Next slide. So this may be a GP, a very important feedback source for you in terms of your mental and physical health. This is around uh, your age-appropriate health screening, your risk uh, risk profiling for cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, even cognitive risk. Uh, and of course, GPs are well equipped with recall systems and um, a great advocate for you in the wider health system. Next slide. Your supports are also, uh, oh, sorry, next slide again. Supports are a great source of feedback. Who, who do you seek feedback from amongst your personal supports, the people who are your non-professional support, who, who does give you honest, truthful feedback? And the same professional, who gives you that honest, truthful feedback? Patients give us feedback, colleagues give us feedback, our own family members give us feedback, and it may come from unexpected sources. Next slide. Like these, I mean, your hairdresser can give you tremendous feedback about all sorts of things and often uh, giving your diary to your partner and saying, just have a look at my diary and tell me what you think. What a great exercise that is. You may be shocked what they tell you. They say, this is ridiculous, it's unsustainable. So often having someone look at your life and say, just tell me what you think of how I'm going. Describe your working week to a colleague and just see what they say, tremendous feedback. So next slide, I think where people are unsustainable and where mental health professionals fall short is generally their inputs are inadequate, their operating manual is flawed or they don't adhere to it, their outputs may be way too narrow, focus on one thing and working unsustainably in one area or way too broad and too excessive and their feedback is either weak or they don't adhere to it. Next slide. A common... Uh, a study, the Mabel study is a Melbourne Monash University study about doctors, particularly doctors' um, health and well-being and, and work-life balance. And there's a very common, um, there's a curve here that shows that the people are least satisfied at the age of 41. This is where people often feel as though they've got to make some dramatic change to their life, either running off with a secretary or changing their career or, or doing something like that, making 
uh, some sort of rash decisions because they feel that they can't go on. They say, I just can't keep doing this. And what they're saying is, I'm not sustainable in with what's currently happening. So when we look at this again, next slide, the reasons are that the inputs have faded over time, much like the trajectory of a cannonball. Next slide. Their operating manual is flawed and it just encourages auto combustion. <laughs> Next slide. Their outputs uh, probably have come at a price. So at the end of the journey, they've actually chewed up a lot of themselves to get to where they are. And this is obviously very suboptimal. And finally, next slide. Feedback, they either don't seek it or they don't heed it when they receive it. So next slide. I'll just again get you to reflect on the workbook and think, uh, you know, where are my inputs currently from? Are they adequate for what I want to do? Do I have um, systems in place in my operating manual that are really going to help me uh, use those resources to, to optimise what I do in my working, in, in my professional personal life, my outputs? Am I doing too much in one area? Am I trying to do too much across a whole range of areas? And feedback. Where do I actually get that from? Who do I listen to? Who tells me that I'm going great or I'm not going well? And I think this is what we hope you'll reflect on in the uh, webinar today. So Nicola, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Roger. Um, it's fascinating when I was introduced to this model. I think there's a lot for um, all of us to, to take in and I encourage everybody to um, yeah, kind of let that soak in a little bit. There's a, a lot of areas and I think some things will jump out of at us and maybe some asterisks on things that we think we might want to come back to and spend a bit of, bit of time on. I think the one that um, I'm just, uh, has, is resonating with me is the balance of work. You know, in each of our roles, we can get drawn into different, different pieces, but which bits of us, you know, to Marie Kondo or whatever her name is, like what brings us joy, you know, which bits of work really sustain us, I think is an interesting thing to look at and how much of that is in the mix of the have to do's and so forth. So there's a lot to, to unpack there and we'll, and we'll get into it. But um, Hugh, I'm happy to, to hand over to you. So um, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola, and uh, thanks, Roger, for that. And uh, that was a good overview of uh, all the aspects. And I suppose one, the one that I'm going to particularly focus in on is the operational manual. That's the way you do things. And, uh, and in particular, I'm going to be talking about time and how people manage that or don't manage it in some cases as well. So, so, so welcome along. Uh, look, um, a lot of people say to me that they're bad at maths. <laughs> in fact, in my experience, many people are bad at counting. Now, what makes me think that? Well, uh, I'll work with lots of people, whether it's GPs or professionals or whatever, and uh, they'll say to me, oh, I only work part time or I get home at six o'clock every day or whatever. And I think, oh, you must have all this time off. You must be spending all this time on other things. But then when you talk to them further, uh, you find out that on those other days or in the evening, they're doing all this other stuff, all this other stuff they haven't told you about, like catching up on reports in the evening or out of hours meetings or preparing for that meeting tomorrow that you're worried about or checking emails during lunchtime, or attending webinars like this late in the evening when you're doing something else. <laughs> All of these things are work, but people don't count them. And, and these are what I call the hidden hours. So, so I've come to the conclusion that people aren't very good at counting their real hours. So I'm going to help you out now a bit. I'm going to help you count. And um, what I'm doing is going to introduce you to the magic number of time. And the magic number is 168. And that's the number on the screen right there. And that is the number of hours in a week. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a little image now that will hopefully last with you for the rest of your life. <laughs> because uh, this little plastic tube that I have here, and you need to look at the picture of me or the video, this little plastic tube represents one week in your life. 168 hours. And time is a great democracy. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a, a, a patient or a clinician or a prime minister, whatever, we all get the same amount of time. So when you look at other people and think, they have more time than me, no, they don't. They have the same amount. But the difference between us here this evening are our commitments against the time. And that's what the little balls represent. And I'm going to go through them with you now. And so let's say this one is your clinical work, you know, seeing your patients or your clients, whatever. And that one can be a happy one or a sad one, depending on how the day is going. Uh, the orange, let's say that's for administration and paperwork and bureaucracy and all the things you have to do in life. There's a little brain in here. 
So that's, that's for keeping up to date and policies and procedures and education and things. <laughs> I'm even more generous, there's a little heart in here. So that could be for your family and friends and people you care about. <laughs> I'm even more generous, there's a little sports ball in here. So that could be for activities, walking or swimming or something like that. And uh, you need to look at me in the picture. And uh, this one at the end, this one is things like lunchtime and uh, sleep and all those other things. So what happened is the tube is full with all those balls. And then out of nowhere, another new ball appears. <laughs> and this could be somebody giving it to you, or sometimes you even go out and get them yourselves. <laughs> but you should know that when people give you opportunities, they tell you lies. And the first lie they always tell you is, this won't take any time at all. This will be really easy. <laughs> and the second lie they tell you is, um, we'll help. And once you say yes, the help disappears. And the ball goes into your tube along with all the other balls and they all squeeze up a little bit. But what you have to notice is they don't all squeeze up equally. So the clinical work, seeing the patients, that doesn't get any less. The paperwork, that's probably got more now because you've taken on more things. So the ones that do get squeezed up will be your education, your pressure development, your planning. <laughs> and your family and friends, I haven't seen them for a while. And what you tell yourself is, this is just a busy time. When things settle down, I'll spend more time with my friends or family or whatever. <laughs> Interests, well, I used to go walking or swimming, haven't done that for a long time. Must catch up and on that again when things settle down a little bit. <laughs> I've got bad news for you. <laughs> this is not a busy time. <laughs> this is your life. It's always going to be like this. I'll bet last week was like this, the week before, last year was like this. It's always going to be busy. It's one of the things for high achievers. They just take on too many things. So that's the first thing is you have to count how many balls are in the tube. And I'll bet for most people it's just too many commitments. So then what happens is people come to this workshop and they say, I know what I'll do. I'll take all the balls out of the tube. I'm going to reorganize my life. And you get up early in the morning and try and do your email before you get started and check your reports during lunchtime and you move them all around. And that is going to work for about two days. <laughs> and then very quickly, the laws of the universe reassert themselves. 168 hours in the week and just moving things around a bit doesn't really solve the problem. If you're doing too many things, doing different order doesn't particularly help. So that's the first thing everyone has to do is just count how many balls are in the tube. And again, that's one of the exercises Roger would have there, you know, think about all your commitments, all the things you have to do. However, despite the tube being jammed full like that, then out of nowhere comes this lovely new shiny ball. <laughs> and this is the nicest one you have ever seen. It's where someone says, we'd like to get involved in this research project. Would you like to take on the chairperson role of this new committee or something like that? And you go, oh, look at that one. It's the best one I've ever seen. And then you start lying to yourself. Oh, look, I'm sure I could squeeze it in. It won't take that much time. Because, of course, the concern is if you let that one go, there'll never be an opportunity like that again. <laughs> the problem for all of you is not lack of opportunities. It's too many opportunities. If you just close your eyes and let that one go, about 10 minutes later, there's another new shiny ball, there's another project. So the deal is, if this is such a great opportunity, which of these ones are you going to get rid of? Because it's not as well as, it's either or. You can't do it all, and that's the illusion, I can do it all. So that means, yes, I'll take on that role, I'll join that group, or do that extra thing, but I will give up my family. <laughs> Probably not a great choice. I see that happening with professionals all the time. Work, 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 this is just a busy time. I'll take that one on, but I'll give up my health. I can imagine nobody do that, would they? See that happening all the time. People go, this is just a busy time. So we don't do it by choice. It just creeps up on you. So the deal is if you're going to do this, you've got to give up something else. And that's when all of you are going to say, but I can't give up any of those. Well, then you can't do this. It's not as well as it's either or. And that leads us into the difficult situation of having to say no to shiny balls. <laughs> and I just have to explain to you from a psychology point of view why that's difficult. And Because uh, when somebody's there asking you to do something, at that moment, about 90% of your rational brain cells completely disappear. <laughs> and the only brain cells left are the ones that are saying, if you say no, something bad's going to happen. And before you know it, the word yes comes out of your mouth. And then they go off really happy. And about 20 minutes later, your brain comes back and says, why did you agree to that? <laughs> but it's too late then because now you got it and you try and talk yourself into it. So the strategy I suggest you learn is learning how not to say yes to things. 
I'll give you an example how to do that. What you need to do is buy yourself a little bit of time to think. You say, look, look, thanks for that. Um, look, I'll need to check my diary and I'll call you back. Can I get back to you a bit later? And then you can look at options. Can I do it now? Maybe I don't want to do it. I can do it not now, but in next week I can do it. Or maybe I can do a part of it. Or I can delegate some part. Or maybe I'll say yes or no. But at least then you're looking at reality rather than automatic have to do everything that comes along. Now, uh, this sounds really easy to say that, but of course, this is really hard when the person's there looking at you because you have all these doubts and worries, you know. Uh, they'll never ask me again. Um, they'll be so disappointed. They'll be annoyed. I I'll miss out on something. I really want to do it. I should be doing it. I have to do it. All these doubts and worries. And so that's when you need to buy yourself a little bit of time to think and look, is this really true or is it accurate? So, so, that's, so that's one to set up. But of course, this is really hard in practice. And I just want to get uh, Nicola to move on to the next slide there, because you can say no, but the problem then is your brain is still thinking about all the things you should be doing, and you're not actually even enjoying the time off or the boundary. And uh, I like this. I used to work with uh, GPs, uh, with Roger and, and group, and I remember talking to the partner of one of the GPs once, and she said, or he said, uh, patients get the best and we get the rest. Well, that means you're giving your best energy to people you don't know very well. And then you come home late in the evening and you lie down on the sofa like a wet sock and your family sees the worst of you, which is probably not the way we most of it wanted to be. So uh, how do you switch off? Uh, and it's especially all that guilt, all the doubts and worries that are going around. So we just have to talk about that. And um, so uh, I'm just going to get you to uh, move on to the next slide, Nicola, there. So uh, I suppose some strategies for switching off are, first of all, it is almost impossible to switch off if you have 24 hours a day, seven days a week, new cycle and that stuff coming along. So switching off means switching off alerts, alarms, notifications, and particularly at the moment, it means going on a news diet. You cannot be okay if you're constantly getting overwhelmed by all this bad news. So you need to limit your taking on that. Next slide, Nicola, is uh, about boundaries. And that's switching off. And uh, I suppose we're talking about two types of boundaries here. Uh, one are, are time boundaries and place boundaries. And time boundaries is a certain amount of time. When am I going to stop? Not when I think I've done enough, but it's going to be five o'clock or six o'clock, not whenever I feel. And place boundaries are uh, where do you work? And this is particularly hard for many people who are working from home at the moment because it's almost impossible to have those boundaries. But you need to have a little place where work happens and it doesn't happen. And if you're sitting on the sofa watching TV, answering your emails, you're not switching off. Next slide, Nicola. Uh, and then other strategies, I suppose, to help get rid of the guilt, the worries are, as Roger pointed out, most of us are very sedentary. So exercise is really good for you physically, but it's also good for you mentally, because when you're out there walking, you're not thinking about the stuff behind you. Next slide, Nicola. Uh, activities, uh, whatever you like to do, whether it's running or creative writing or knitting or sleeping, watching movies, it doesn't really matter, but anything rather than your mind going off into all the guilt, I should be doing something else. And so learning how to switch that off. Next slide. And then other distractions are, are good ways are music. Music is great because it creates mood and when you makes you feel good. Uh, listen to instead of listening to the news, listen to podcasts or audiobooks, watching movies, re reading, and I'm talking about reading books. <laughs> if you want something to wind down tonight to help you go to sleep, put away your Kindle or your iPad and get out a book and read that because you won't get any notifications as you're going along. Um, okay, next slide. The other one I think in terms of doing this is uh, especially is noticing your early warning signs. And these are the signs that you're starting to get stressed. And uh, uh, you'll all be familiar with road rage. <laughs> well, one of my early warning signs is furniture rage. That means getting angry with the furniture. You know, you walk through the house and you bump into the table, bloody table. It's not the table's fault, it's just that I'm not paying attention. Some of you might have physical signs, and they're really helpful, like headaches or pains or increased appetite. But they're important in terms of, I suppose, feedback, really. And very common ones are shortness of temper or getting irritated or a loss of sense of humor. You know, you get irritated with small things. Now, if you don't know what your early warning signs are, here's a fun exercise for the evening. <laughs> Ask your partner or family member or whatever, and they will delight in taking out a big sheet of paper and making a big long list. And you can do the same for them, and you probably won't talk to each other for the rest of the evening after that. <laughs> Next slide, Nicola. Uh, so when you do notice your early warning signs, then what do you do? Well, first of all, some time out, you know, go and boil the kettle, walk around the house for a few minutes, uh, whatever it might be, just a moment or two just to calm yourself down. Next slide. Uh, this is when it'd be really good to have a support crew, someone you could talk to, a friend or someone else you could talk. 
And uh, again, next slide. If you don't have someone to talk, writing it down helps. It just gets it out of your head so you don't have to keep thinking about it. And again, that tool that Roger showed you is really helpful. Once you write all those things down, you get a bit of picture of what the whole thing looks like. So, so that helps. Now, hopefully that might help. But sometimes those thoughts are very, very persistent. They're hard to get rid of. So next slide. And I'm sure all of you, uh, um, next slide again, um, Nicola. Uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the statistics. You know, one in five people like to be experiencing a mental health issue. That means one of five of all the people here this evening as well. And when you are not going so well, of course, the last thing you want to do is reach out. You want to isolate yourself and not uh, ask for help. But next slide, the good news is <laughs> there is support, but you have to ask for it. And that's where having your friends, uh, having mentors, having supervisors, the clinical supervisors, the counseling services, psychologists, whatever, these are really important. And that's when things aren't going well, not just tell other people to do it, but doing it for yourself as well. And the last one, and next slide again, last slide, is it's important to look after yourself, but I also think we have a big obligation to look after each other as well. And uh, that's our colleagues, you know, asking them, how are you going? When you see one of your colleagues isn't going so well, just say, how is it going for you? Are you okay? Because um, the last thing I suppose I'm going to say is I started off by saying people can't count or don't count. But remember the magic number. I'm going to finish off by saying people do count. <laughs> you count. All of us here this evening count. You are important to look after your, enough to look after yourself. And finally, it would be good if we could count on each other. And that means when things aren't going well, that you have someone to call on or access support as well. So I'm going to leave it there. Back to you, Nicola. Thank you so much, Hugh. Um, it's a lot to, to go into there. Um, yeah, um, I feel like I said, a lot, said yes to a shiny bauble <laughs> this week. <laughs> So I'm just sitting here thinking, oh, I, I, yes, it resonates. Um, so thank you very much. Um, that was wonderful, guys. I really um, enjoyed listening to it. And I'm, I'm just juggling questions and screens and things. So you've got to forgive me if I'm looking, looking down a little bit. In working from home, printing things out is not as easy as it is otherwise. But we... Um, you need to be congratulated because you st stuck perfectly to time, which is wonderful because it leaves us with um, time for questions. So a couple of things to acknowledge. We have uh, a number of questions that have come through for, through registrants that I've got here and I'm going to group together and, and, and fire them off at the panel. Um, we've also got questions. So the Q&A um, button is there for people to send through their questions. Keep the chat you want to chat chat in the chat box but if you have some questions for either Hugh or Roger um, please send them through I do want to just say there's a little tip that if you want to make that slide smaller and uh, panelists bigger which is probably nicer for Q&A there is an icon with two arrows inside it two arrows inside a circle um, in the top right hand corner of your window so those of you at home might want to do that so we can see um, Hugh and Roger while we fire some questions at them. I'm going to start with um, one that has come through and Hugh it might be a good one for you. Andrew has asked, he's a GP and he's heard his psychologist colleagues talk about clinical supervision um, or professional supervision, and he's just wondering if we could uh, cover off what that is and what that may look like for a GP, please. Yeah, well, look, I, I, again, if anybody who's in a sort of a medical role or, or a caring role uh, needs supervision, uh, and my, I would advise them to have some supervision for, for two reasons. One, uh, for, you know, legal purposes to make sure you're giving good advice or that you've checked things out, but also just to be able to debrief, to talk about things, to get it out there, because if you spend all day working with other people, giving them advice and giving them all these things, uh, that's going to wear you out. And, and often you're going to take on things from the people you're working with as well. And so you're sort of loading all this up. And uh, health professionals and medical health professionals, mental health professionals think, I can take on all this stuff and it's not going to affect me. Mm. And of course, that's crazy, really. You, you know well it's going to affect you. You cannot expect to take on all these problems and, and just be fine. And so that means uh, some way to unburden yourself. As I said, talking about it, talking about it with a colleague, talking about a supervision or somebody like that. And, and in some fields, you know, in psychologists, you are, you're required to have some sort of clinical supervision or somebody you can go and talk to. And that's... Also, again, it, it, it's helpful from a legal point of view, but also just from your personal point of view to be able to unload and get it out there as well. So I would encourage anybody who's going to be in that role, a, a caring role or a providing role, to get supervision from that in some way or other. 
So that that's for anybody, I think. Uh, Roger might more talk about from the GP sort of world, but uh, in my view, and especially with mental health protection, because it's such draining work, emotional work, and uh, you, you need to be able to to. And, and people think you have to do that when you're under stress or when it's when it's got critical. Uh, I think that needs to be part of routine, part of what you do. And as one of the things Roger talked about, where are you getting your feedback from? So I'll hand over to Roger on the, on that for the GP side. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Really, is around. Um, I mean, it gets back to. I guess if I refer back to the model, um, I mean, supervision is a, a form of feedback. It's external feedback, absolutely critical. And we, we've all got the little guy on our left shoulder saying, telling us what we think is going wrong with us, what we should be doing. It's our it's our internal feedback. It's not useful. It's often. Um, critical overly critical and too narrow so we must seek external feedback from somebody and a um a, a, a supervision of any sort is appropriate for any age through from student years right through to pre-retirement we can all benefit from that so that feedback uh, becomes a very important input and then the input of course translates into our operating manual so that the supervisor can say i'm just going to watch you working today you see and what they'll observe is how you work in other words where you work why you work um, you know how you arrange your day how you arrange your appointment system um, how you manage your patients uh, so if you're for example very avoidant and you uh, you've had great difficulty saying no to patient requests and or you may be very a, a de dependent personality type who really enjoys people both of those things may mean you you become very very thorough and you take longer than you booked. So you may run over time, for example, as an example. So you're running over time, one patient, and then you run over time with the second one. And your supervisor they're watching, thinking, why, why is this happening? And they might say to you, it's obvious you're spending too much time with each patient. And you say, well, I, I you know, they need my advice. I really enjoy, I really enjoy working with people. Uh, so someone externally can say, but you're running over time all the time. You've got no time to write up your case notes thoroughly. So you clearly, the way you're working, your operating manual is telling you that you've given yourself permission to run over time. So that's a flaw in the way you work, which may suit your personality type, but it's making life more difficult to work. And the other thing they may do is look at your outputs. They might think, look, you know, having someone look at your working week and sit down and watching how you work and how much you're doing and what roles you're taking on can say, look, you know, the way you're working, it's just, it's incredible, but it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Um, and you're doing way too much. I really admire what you're doing, but it's not sustainable, you see. So that, that supervision can be really wonderful uh, external feedback in those four pillars that you have to look at. And so that's something you may not see yourself. Thank you both Hugh and Roger. Um, just a quick note, yes, you will get the slides, um, everybody who's asking, um, the slides will be available as well as the, the workbook and so forth. One of the things that's coming through in the chat is the yes but, um, which we anticipated um, because we all struggle with it and that's exactly why we're doing this tonight. Um, so I'm just going to read one of the questions which I think sums it up and this is from Brooke. These are nice theories that we know we have to do and we all have to do more self-care, but it doesn't change the real issues being in the stressful environments we work in and the incredible time and financial pressures we are under. Without the overarching problems changing, I don't see how we can implement these smaller ideas. So any, um, we had a number of questions around this in the registration that's kind of external pressures. Um, how do we, Anybody want to offer a comment on that, the, the, the kind of external mm. that can yep. push our good intents? Roger? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, that's a really good question. And how, you know, we can all relate to that question. Um, we're working in a stressful environment that we can't change. So you're caring, a really good, caring person working in a very demanding environment that you can't change. Now, how common is that? Think of you know working in a clinic environment where, as I said before, you're 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 dancing to the beat of the receptionist's drum who keeps <laughs> you know overbooking you. You may attract a cohort of patients because of the sort of person you are. You're you're a 
a very nice person who people can tell anything to and they love coming to see you and you're popular, you're the much loved mental health practitioner. So you draw this cohort of very demanding patients and we all get that and you get the same sort of complex demanding patients who come to you because you're so good at it, you see, you're so kind and nice and you run overtime all the time to give them everything that they want. So you might have difficulty saying no, as Hughes pointed out, uh, refusing. So you're in an environment that you think you can't control, but in fact, you've actually chosen to be in that environment. Most often you've chosen to be there and that's your, your operating manual has directed you to say, I, I, I'm going to work in this way. I'm going to work in a busy environment where care is required and where the booking systems aren't ideal for me, but I'm going to put up with them. And, uh, you know, I'm going to take work home. Another decision is in your operating manual, I'm going to take work home because I can remotely log in from home and tidy up those notes or just, you know, follow people up uh, and maybe come in on a weekend or work on a Saturday morning to catch up. So how we work is often much up to us. And uh, you think, well, if you're working in a very stressful environment, you've got to ask yourself, why am I here? Is this where I'm producing my best outputs? Or am I paying a price for this? Am I burning all my carriages to, to get through the day? So that's where feedback comes in. And uh, having a mentor, having an advisor, having a supervisor, is showing somebody and saying, this is how I'm working this week, and this is where I'm working. And probably people will say, well, why are you working there? And clearly, that environment doesn't suit you. You're a person who needs time in an unhurried environment where you can be thorough and detailed and practice the best mental health professional work that you can. But why are you working in such a busy place? It doesn't suit you. So very often, you're in the wrong place. Thank you, Roger. Hugh, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, look, I back of everything Roger said, and I suppose it, it's almost the perfect storm, really, because you have, you have people who want to help, who like caring for people, but also probably high achievers, so they want to do it really well, and they do a very thorough job, very uh, whatever, in a system that is infinite. <laughs> because in health and in mental health, no matter how hard you work, you're never going to get to the end. The illusion is somehow I'm going to get there. And the reality is, no, you're not going to get there. In fact, probably the harder work the more you're going to create the more require more demand and so forth and it's infinite and again we talk about the system and isn't it awful and whatever absolutely you know we can all talk about trying to change the world but uh, it's a really tough system to change so then what you have to do is go back to what can i change and control the controllables here i can't do everything what can i do and that's roger just pointed out some of the things you can do you know that we do have some choices often we don't like the choices but there are some choices and you have to make decisions about that and, and understand and uh, again going back to my, my tube and balls you know people said i've got no choice well if you have no choice you better not be doing new things you know you have to limit what you can do you're going to got a small area of uh, discretion so you better choose that really wisely so we usually have a little bit more than we think and again that's where uh, john roger talked about seeing a supervisor or a colleague or a mentor they can give you a bit of advice on that maybe there are because when you're in it often you don't see the options you think there's this is the only way it is i just have to keep going i've got to get through to the end uh, but uh, the sad illusion is you're never going to get to the end there's always going to be more and so that's when and this is where the guilt kicks in for a lot of people is but i, I should be doing more and that's this is when it becomes very unsustainable because if you think personally you are going to change everything you're going to burn out. And I, uh, Roger and I see this all the time in, in the GP land, you know, where pe people just burn themselves out and say, I'm leaving, I can't do this anymore. Mm. And then it doesn't help at all. And so that's where it's that ability to say, this is a limit, this is what I can do, be comfortable with that, and then come back tomorrow and have another go. Yeah, you can't drink from an empty cup. And that's yeah, that exactly right. right. Yeah. Notion of what um, we, we say to others that we don't mm. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to keep, we've got lots of questions, so I'm going to keep going on. I'm just going to address one really quickly because I think you guys have addressed it. Mariana is asking about optimising working processes that is taking a lot of time to do clinical notes. I think you guys have answered that. Get a mentor, ask for some help, you know, get get a colleague or somebody else to look at your notes. They shouldn't, they're taking you an excessive amount of time. Then some people are really good at it and, you know, we need to draw on that expertise of others, I think, as well. But I'm really interested, um, a number of questions have come through on this around practitioners themselves reaching out for help, you know, if they are what, in the one, one in five or they're experiencing mental health issues themselves or they're concerned about colleagues um, and the stigma and so forth associated with that. How can we 
help ourselves help each other in, in that space. Um, maybe Roger, you first and, and Hugh, if you want to add on. Yeah, that's a, a very broad question. Um, and <laughs> it, it goes to the heart of what we do. I mean, we, 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 are, we, are, we are lovely people practicing uh, clinical care on, on uh, quite complex people. And, um, you know, we, we are drawn to this because we're people, people. We like working with people. We like helping people and caring for people. And we like good outcomes. We don't like harming people. We don't want any poor outcomes. It really upsets us to, to have someone, uh, you know, uh, um, suffer demise under our care. It's, it's, it's something we avoid. And as I said before, we're drawn to it because we are often obsessional and the previous question around detail, if you're obsessional, you're going to take very detailed notes. Mm. And uh, there may not be time to do that, which is part of the stress. Or you may be avoidant or dependent and all those other things that we, we know about. So we, we're drawn to our work in a way that that we want to do really well at it. We want to um, care for people and have good outcomes. And yet we, we are expected to work in a whole range of different work, workplaces. Uh, some of which are hostile and toxic and, and unfriendly and unhelpful and they're harmful and they're full of workplace health and safety hazards, full of them. Violent, think violence, think uh, uh, drug drug using patients, um, you know, think uh, working in remote locations. Uh, there's so many pressures on us that add up and the burden I spoke about earlier is often we take on a lot of burden. And there comes a point where your barrow, your wheelbarrow is full of bricks, which are the problems that you, we, we take on and choose to take on. And that can become exhausting. Uh, and then people say, well, what do I do? Where do I go? Because in, in our pursuit of um, clinical excellence and working in our careers, we often do forget about ourselves. So we don't, we may have lost contact with our GP. We may have ignored our good lifestyle habits and perhaps set aside exercise and good eating and maybe, we may be drinking a little more alcohol than we should have. So these, well, these things are all add up. So over time, we get to the point where you think, look, I, I, what do I do? So through our training, we think, well, I shouldn't be getting this or I, I can handle this myself. So it's not unusual for mental health practitioners to manage their own uh, stress problems, you know, fairly uh, in a way that others might say you should have stopped doing that six months to go. In other words, we may manage self-manage our problems way past the point that we should. And we may be reluctant to seek help because one, we don't know who to go to. Uh, we may have lost contact with other health professionals and just don't know how to access them. There may be fear of notification to the to the board, to the uh, to, to APRA. There may be embarrassment about going to another person and saying, well, you know, and they might say, well, how, how could you let yourself get into the state? Did, you couldn't you've done something more to help yourself? There's this sort of embarrassment that that might be the case. There's a, a, a many, many barriers that stop professionals going to another person to help. But a great, in my experience in running a, a doctor's health program is that the physical and the mental are very, very much a part of distress. You cannot say I'm just mentally unwell. You'll always be physiologically challenged in some way. And the five things that may like vitamin D, hydration, nutrition, aerobic fitness, sleep deprivation, all of those uh, are very, very common. So having a good holistic appraisal of your health is a great starting point. And, and to connect with a general practitioner, um, it takes time, as we know, to find a good uh, general practitioner, but they're very connected with the health system. And once you've found one or a practice that you work with, that's a very good start. But the temptation is to overmanage our own problems. So I've seen this so often way past the point that we should and very often we get the diagnosis completely wrong completely wrong we get it so wrong because we we the little guy on the shoulder says you've got fatigue you're just you know you're tired or you're just overworked whereas an external feedback might say you're clinically depressed or you're burnt out to the point where you must stop work now and have two or three four weeks off so we i mean there's some of the aspects i think that i've seen Thank you, Roger. Hugh, did you want to add to that, perhaps about if you're concerned about a colleague and how they're treated? Yeah. 
Yeah, first of all, uh, I just pick it on Roger's point there is, you know, by definition, you know, if you're something sort of a mental health issue or you're feeling depressed, you're probably not making very good decisions because the thing you need to make the decisions is impaired. It's not working so well. So that's when you, you're, you're probably not your best doctor or your best sort of supporter for yourself. So that's when talking to somebody else. The other thing I suppose in supporting colleagues, I think, is, is that we need to support each other. And I think this network, the Mental Health Professionals Network, is a really good idea. People should be a part of that because you'd like a profession where people looked after each other. Not just uh, look, and, you know, look on themselves, but look after colleagues as well. I remember working with a person once and they said, you know, they were joining this practice and they said, I thought I was joining practice, <laughs> but I was actually joining a room, mm. which means you go in every day and you sit in a room and see patients. You don't see any of the colleagues at all. Yeah. And that's where as a group or as a practice or a co- you can actually support each other. And uh, that means having morning teas together, having lunches together, social things like that. And when you notice one of your colleagues isn't going so well there, what you have to do is ask the, t- the classic question that you will ask other people, are you okay? Mm-hmm. And again, don't have to fix their problem, but just it, just saying, how are you? And just, just allowing the person to talk about that and bring it out there and sort of get that discussion going. So I think, uh, again, this is one of the things you can control. We can't control the whole system, but you could actually reach out and support your colleagues, look after them and encourage them to do things as well. And so that's when I think one of the first things is because the person themselves might not be making a good judgment. That's when you as a colleague, and I would encourage all the people here tonight to think about the people you work with. Is there someone there who maybe you should be saying, how are you going? Do you want to call? Let's have a coffee, just have a chat. And especially, I think, in these lockdown days when you don't see them so easily, you know, they're, they're already probably stressed now, isolated as well. And that's where a call or a phone call or an email or whatever might be useful. Yeah, just, I'll just pick up that point. It has such a strong point. Is, um, is a lot of us uh, work in practices or in clinics, but we often work in isolation. We're often quite lonely in those rooms. And, you know, you're in a busy place with people shutting doors and opening doors. And, but very often there's that isolation from your colleagues and peers. And yet one thing we all value the most is to sit down with people who understand our world. They get our world. And you say, look, this is what I, I had a patient like this today. And they go, oh, God, I had exactly the same person last week. Or... I know exactly what you're talking about. You need that sort of understanding. And if it's work-related, that's very powerful. Here's the idea around a peer group, a phone group, um, mm. a peer support network is very important just to talk about the sort of difficulties of being a person. Um, and if you, you'll see colleagues, too, I'm sure everybody tonight who's listening would know somebody they work with or maybe working with at the moment who they're a little bit worried about. But the, the thing I've observed uh, certainly with doctors is that they are they withdraw and they're very good actors. They're very good actors. <laughs> so if you um, they can cover up their distress very easily. And if you go up to them and say, you know, how are you going? They'll say, oh, fine, fine, fine. But you've got to be inquisitive and persistent, uh, and uh, because they'll, most health professionals will put out barriers because they're worried about being notified, reported, embarrassment, all the mm. things I spoke about. So if you're inquisitive, you'll find that they are extremely responsive because they're often desperate for someone to help them get through what is maybe a professional problem or a personal problem. So having a pathway for those colleagues, I think, is yeah. important. And as a practice, you can work out as a group what you will do if someone becomes unwell. I think there's also um, somebody made a comment, which is, you know, you can never find time, you have to make time. And I've noticed in, in my work... Uh, well, working remotely um, and not necessarily in, in direct clinical work, but supporting clinical work. Um, I've been in a number of meetings recently where the agenda has actually gone out the window and we've actually spent majority of the session actually checking in and, and, and not saying, how's everyone? Okay, let's go. And actually stopping and pausing. And um, it, it, uh, my observation is that if that's done with genuine curiosity and a, a willingness to, to listen, um, it's amazing what people will share if they feel safe to do so. And it's we're not fixing it in that moment, but it's actually acknowledging that this is a real thing that is happening um, at the moment where people's fatigue is getting the best of them um, and just stopping and actually thinking, you know, the agenda can probably wait perhaps for, for a little bit because none of us are as productive as we would like to be and to Hugh's point around productivity. So I think we should never underestimate as well just carving out a little bit of time mm. to actually, you know, maybe not book yourself back to back and say, well, I don't know, guys, how about next week, you know, the practice, we all come together and have morning tea together and 
those mm. protective things don't have to be massive, but they can they can really add up if we mm. well they add up if we don't have them, but they can add up in a positive way if we do prioritise them. I think. Yeah, the little things make a difference. I mean, the other point I'd make is if you feel as though you're experiencing some distress, odds are over 50% of your colleagues will be feeling exactly the same thing. Yes. So if you say at a meeting, oh, I'm absolutely exhausted, they'll go, yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. Or I like to work, see one patient less per hour. Oh, yeah, I'd love to do that too. Yes. So if you, if all you need to do is break the ice and you get people saying, right, we're all suffering the same thing. Let's do something about it. And that permission, I've, I've noticed that in my work in the last week, somebody said I took the, you know, wellbeing day were offered and I spent it and I felt restored. You know, it's not, I don't need three months off necessarily but if I take a day off that might give me a couple more months before I really do need yeah. you know might need that. Um, one point I'd, I want to make on that and for everybody as well is uh, this is not normal yeah. <laughs> so that means don't be expecting your normal output yes you're not going to see as many people you're not going to get as much done and that, that's the reality is it's not normal but people think I should carry on as normal and that's not this is not normal we can say for sure I just want to pick up, there's been a couple of comments as well, and this is probably the last question before I get you um, both to, to wrap up, is a little bit about the, the current context and that um, some people are talking about the, the extra, are other people finding it more fatiguing to do telehealth versus in person and so forth? And um, I think you've, you've chatted a little bit about it, Hugh, but that, that notion of, um, I think the other thing that's really interesting is the parallel experience, you know, I have talked about this in the session today, the, um, as help providers, we are experiencing the same adversity that all our patients and clients are. So, yeah, how we might manage that or, or I don't know, name it. You guys got some insight about, about the current circumstances that we're all in? Yeah, so do you look at my comment is uh, this is not normal. Uh, some people are coping really well, you know, like it suits them. The more introverted people are thinking, this is great, it's got a, I've got a name for it now, a lockdown, I love it. But most people aren't finding it okay, you know, they're missing connections, whatever. But also the workload has increased and people talk about working from home. <laughs> That's not what's really happening. <laughs> what's happened, working from home used to be a treat. It used to be a day away from the office where you could sit quietly with no one interrupting you. Now people are at home trying to work under difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're just not going to get as much done. So I would think, yeah, if you're finding it hard at the moment, there's a good reason. And so that means all we can do at the moment is be kind to ourselves and our colleagues and realize you're not going to get as much done and just accept it as the case. And, and uh, sadly as well, in the mental health area, the demands are increasing. And so the pressure is even more. But despite that, if you try and meet it all, you're going to be not sustainable. Yeah. Okay. Roger, do you want to add something on that kind of Yes, yeah, yeah, that's so true. Uh, and again, a great question because COVID um, has added uh, an extra burden to us all. Um, and if you try and link Hugh's uh, metaphor with mine around um, the balls and the, all, the, all the 168 hours in the week. And so what COVID's done is that it has, if you look at the um, out, outputs side of the, the four pillars, we've had to work, all had to work harder in COVID. Um, I mean, the demand on uh, mental, health, mental health practitioners has gone up through the roof. It's been extremely high. So there's a huge obligation to respond to that by working harder, working longer hours, mm. et cetera. Um, and the feedback is when you say, well, look, I'm actually working pretty hard, you say, well, you can't stop really because there's such a demand. You know, so many people now have got mental um, health problems that you just, you know, you, you need to keep going. So uh, in Hugh's 168 hour week, um, when work goes up, often the important inputs go down. So our exercise goes down, our diet may deteriorate, time with family, time with friends, time with creative activities goes down. So your inputs are weakened in COVID and then going up to your operating manual, how you're working, well, you're having to work very differently. You know, and you do telehealth now, and I've done that, and it, it is, I don't enjoy it, it's exhausting. Uh, you can't build rapport with people, you can't read their body language, it's, it's hard work, boy. So COVID's meant we, our inputs are reduced, our um, operating manual is had to be rewritten to, to do work differently, our outputs have increased, and no one's listening about feedback, see? So no, no wonder we're all suffering a bit. Um, but the, w the way I'd say is go back to your inputs. To do more work in a more difficult thing, you need to be fit, rested, 
you know, eat well, vitamin D, exercise. It goes back to those basic physiological inputs that I think are often forgotten and often make life jolly difficult. So if it's getting tough, back to the basics. Eat modest amounts of good food, get seven hours sleep a night, two and a half hours of exercise a week if you can, vitamin D, and um, yeah, don't watch TV. <laughs> Oh, I, I'm with you until the end there, Roger. <laughs> you lost me. <laughs> if I do all the other things, can I watch some TV? Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you both for some final thoughts, anything that you haven't covered that you'd like um, to make sure that we share with, I think we've had 1,300 people joining us tonight, um, over 1,300, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, any, any leaving thoughts or additional thoughts that you want to cover off. I'll go to you first, Hugh. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, look, my, my thoughts are uh, health and uh, mental health, the demands are infinite. <laughs> no matter how hard you work, you're never going to fix everything. However, <laughs> your time is finite. <laughs> there is only 168 hours in the week. So just remember, every time you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to something else. And sadly, you know, what we see is people are saying no to my family, your interests and your health. So you need to learn how to say no. And when you do say no, you have to learn how to switch off, how to switch off that guilt, especially all the thoughts and worries. And I'm sure most of you tell other people how to do this. <laughs> and now you know how to do it for yourself. And so learn how to switch off that sort of nagging voice that's telling you it's all wrong and so forth. So all the things you do for other people, you need to turn it back on yourself. Thank you. Roger? Yeah, all good. I'll just add one point is uh, what is full-time work? This is something I've thought about a fair bit. So if you ask, um, many of you listening tonight will probably be working in varying ways. You might be doing so many sessions a week or however long a session is. Sometimes the session can be three hours or five hours. Or, but it's very often people underestimate how much work they're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, the work, the sort of work we're doing in mental health is very, very, very demanding. It takes a lot of cognitive effort and uh, we're often in a sedentary position where we're, we're not moving around a lot. Um, so it's very important to not underestimate how much work you're actually doing. If you say to somebody, oh, you're working full-time or part-time at the moment, I say, oh, I'm working part-time. And then, so how many sessions a week are you doing? So I'm doing about seven or eight. And you think, right, well, <laughs> that's about, you know, 1.3 FTE already. Mm. So someone working five days a week in mental health is doing about 1.5 FTE. By the time you add up all of the stuff associated with consulting, the amount of time it takes up in your 168 hour week, um, it's more than full time. So don't underestimate how much work you're doing. And we'll get back to the four final messages, the inputs, often the basic ones around our physiology are critical and they're the ones that are often forgotten. How we do, how we run our lives is full of choices there, how we do things. If you finding you're working in a stressful environment, maybe that environment doesn't suit you. You're not suited to it. Get out and do something else. Your outputs, often people do way too much and get feedback from someone independent, external and uh, heed it and um, you know, listen to it. And I think that way you'll be a little bit more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you both Roger and Hugh. I think they've given us a lot to reflect on and think about and I encourage everybody to, you know, have a look at the, the, the handouts that have been provided and prioritise a bit of time to working through them. Um, what is it? You've got to slow down to speed up or whatever the, the comment is, you know, actually to be efficient. Um, all right, we are out to the last minute. I'm going to run through. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, um, you. Hugh and Roger. I think it's been wonderful. I've certainly taken a lot out of it. Please, those of you that are still here, click on the pie chart icon um, and give us your feedback. It's really helpful. It is, uh, we do take it on board and it helps us to shape uh, future MHPN content and also improve our content as we go along. Um, you will get a statement of attendance um, and we will send out the resources and so forth um, that are associated with this webinar. So don't worry about that. You will get all the fantastic uh, information and resources as well as other resources that Hugh and Roger have put together for us. Um, we've got upcoming webinars 
I'll let you read through those because my mouth will <laughs> be full of marbles if I read all of those. Um, so please keep your eye out for them um, coming up over the next uh, weeks and months. We also, MHP and I've got a podcast called Book Club Six Past Series, so please um, get into that and uh, I've checked it out. There's some great ones in there, some really interesting content for all of us to, to have a look at. Um, and lastly, if you'd like to continue the discussion, you can look at our peer networks and MHPN are actually seeking uh, expressions of interest to set up a peer network. So you can provide feedback on that or you can contact, um, I'm going to just find on my third different screen, um, please contact Jackie from MHPN. You can see her email there um, about that. Otherwise, I we're wrapping it up for tonight. Thanks, everybody, for your interest and participation. Before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the lived experience of people in carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Please, um, I think the phrase I used to use a lot with clients and um, from you guys tonight is extend the kindness to yourself that you do to others. So thanks very much, everyone. Take care and um, stay well. Good night.